Hello, I'm Michelle Crowell, and I'm the Civil War and Reconstruction Specialist at the Library of Congress. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak briefly on the Ulysses S. Grant resources at the Library of Congress, among which there are truly treasures. I've approached this as a sort of chronological show and tell display through Grant's life, which allows us to cover different themes and material formats. The brief show and tell tour we're about to embark on is truly just the tip of the iceberg with regard to materials at the library that touch on some aspects of Grant's story. Everything you will see in this presentation is available at the Library of Congress. Many items are accessible in some form on the library's website, which is loc.gov. And I encourage you to explore our online offerings and visit us in person for those materials that do not yet have a digital presence. In the time we have after the presentation, I will be happy to field questions about doing online or virtual or in-person research at the Library of Congress. As the curator of the Ulysses S. Grant papers, I may be biased, but in my opinion, the greatest grant treasure at the Library of Congress is the grant papers in the manuscript division. The Library of Congress largely has the Grant family, and especially Ida H. Grant and her son Ulysses S. Grant III, to thank for this wonderful collection. The collection began to grow in the 1920s, and USG3 continued to contribute materials well into the 1960s. The Grant family members continue to donate collection items into the 21st century. And once in a while, the library is able to add additional grant-related documents. The grant papers contain over 50,000 items, with the gems of the collection being letters from Grant to Julia before and after their marriage, Grant's Civil War headquarter books, Grant's handwritten pages of his memoir, and the manuscript copy of Julia's memoir. Of course, in addition to the grant papers, Ulysses S. Grant is very well represented as a correspondent or a subject in collections of his contemporaries, including the papers of Abraham Lincoln, Edwin M. Stanton, William Tecumseh Sherman, Philip H. Sheridan, Ella Q. B. Washburn, Andrew Johnson, and many others. The Lincoln, Stanton, Sherman, Sheridan, Washburn, and Johnson papers are available online for you to explore. The Ulysses S. Grant papers at the Library of Congress are also available online and can be accessed from the online presentation seen here or through digital content available links in the collection finding aid. One caveat with respect to today's presentation though, for a number of reasons, the manuscript division online collections are derived from, or some of the manuscript division online collections are derived from the microfilm edition of the respective collection. This is true for the bulk of our voluminous presidential papers, including the Ulysses S. Grant papers. However, given the show and tell nature of this evening's presentation, I've taken the liberty of including scans from original materials. So the look of some of the items may be different here than they appear later online, although the intellectual content is the same. Okay, let's start the show. The Library of Congress can offer you materials literally from Grant's birth to death. This illustration depicts the birthplace of Ulysses S. Grant in Point Pleasant, Ohio. I imagine it's a bit nicer and more pastoral looking here than it was in reality, but that tends to be the nature of commemorative illustrations like these. Few of the original materials in the library's collections document Grant's youth or his West Point years. His manuscript memoirs do include a bit about his family history and stories from childhood, as well as his recollections of his feelings of dread at going to the U.S. Military Academy. But the Grant papers do offer one original illustration purportedly done by Grant while at West Point. It's a pencil sketch on tan paper using pencil, charcoal, and china white. And this is one instance in which the microfilm edition actually provides more detail than the original illustration does. If Grant's early years are less represented in his papers than his adult life, the collection really becomes substantive when Julia Dent entered the scene. Ulysses met Julia when he visited his West Point roommate Frederick Dent's familial home on a visit to St. Louis. He was quickly besotted with Fred's sister Julia and they became engaged on May 22, 1844. But Grant's military career and her father's condition that they wait to marry until Grant's professional life was more stable postponed their marriage. While apart, Grant wrote devotedly to Julia. 
Grant wrote a number of letters while he served with the Army in Mexico, including this one on May 24, 1846, from Matamoros, Mexico. Grant is really just adorable, especially in his postscript. P.S. The two flowers you sent me came safe, but when I opened your letter, the wind blew them away and I could not find them. Before I seal this, I will pick a wildflower off of the bank of the Rio Grande and send it to you. My dear Julia, do you ever see me anymore in your dreams? How much I wish you could see me in reality. Series 1A of the Grant Papers contains the majority of Grant's letters to Julia before and during their marriage. This correspondence truly is a treasure in being able to see the personal side of Grant, his love for his wife and children, his humor, and often observations of the world around him that would never make it into an after-action report or a letter to a superior officer. Fortunately, Grant was also a patient man, and it was not until August 22, 1848, that he was able to marry Julia after a four-year engagement. But his military career often kept them separated, which was problematic for the devoted family man, particularly when stationed at remote outposts like Fort Humboldt in California. His spirits fell to a low ebb. His military career was not advancing, and he was at least a thousand miles away from his wife and children, including his namesake son, who he had never seen. You do not know how forsaken I feel here, he wrote to Julia. The place is good enough, but I have interests at others which I cannot help thinking about day and night. Then, too, it is a long time since I made application for orders to go to Washington to settle my accounts, but not a word in reply do I get. Then I feel again as if I had been separated from you and Fred long enough, and as to Ulysses, I have never seen him. He must by this time be talking about as Fred did when I saw him last. How very much I want to see all of you. He resigned his military commission not long after writing this letter and rejoined his family in Missouri. After leaving the Army, Grant tried a number of careers, including farming. He built a place in Missouri, which he aptly called Hardscrabble, as he struggled professionally as a civilian. This is another example of how one needs to be careful in using artistic representations. This is a lithographer's imagination in 1865 of hard, what Hardscrabble was like. To me, it just looks like a home in the rural suburbs. But here's another view of Hardscrabble in 1891. Clearly, the place hasn't been kept up in the nearly 40 years since the Grants lived there but even then it wouldn't be mistaken for a suburban oasis. When the Sub Civil War broke out in April 1861, Grant offered his services to the Union Army and he rejoined the military. You'll notice in this photo taken at Cairo in October 1861, Grant is rocking a long square cut beard rather than the more closely trimmed version with which we are more familiar. Some of you may know the story later told by his son Fred Grant in which his mother, Julia, or Fred's mother, Julia, expressed such a dislike at the length of the beard when she saw it in person that Grant later had it shaved off in St. Louis. Before we might go much further into the Civil War, let's engage in a little tangent about Grant's parents, Jesse Root Grant and Hannah Simpson Grant, who are clearly very jolly people, as you can see. Grant seemed to have difficult relationships with his parents, Neither were apparently demonstrative or open with affection. Hannah was stern, Jesse was a braggart. Jesse seemed to disapprove of many things Grant did, and we get glimpses of their relationship in Civil War correspondence. Evidence of Grant's difficulties with his parents and siblings can definitely be found in his letters to Julia, like this one in March 1862. Like several others I've seen, money comes up frequently as a point of contention. Father is just going back, and I take this, will take this occasion to write you a few lines. You can lend Father all you have, keeping about $100 for yourself, to last until I can send you more. Take a note payable to yourself bearing interest. I feel myself worse used by my own family than by strangers, and although I do not think Father, of his own accord, would do me injustice, yet I believe he is influenced, and always may be, to my prejudice. And of course, there is some thought that Grant's notorious General Orders No. 11 or 12 of December 1862, expelling Jews from his department, may have been prompted to some degree by Jesse's involvement with Jewish businessmen seeking cotton trading arrangements. 
The order was fairly quickly rescinded, but the incident was embarrassing for the Lincoln administration and stuck with Grant. Julia referred to it in her memoirs as, quote, that obnoxious order for which he was so severely reprimanded by the federal Congress. The general said, deservedly so, as he had no right to make an order against any special sect. You might have caught me referring to this as General Order 11 or 12. What we think of as General Orders Number 11 is actually General Orders Number 12, and that is how it is represented in Grant's headquarter books. The order expelling the Jews was originally General Orders Number 11, dated December 17, 1862. But this order overlapped with another General Orders Number 11 of the same date, which dealt with a court martial proceeding. So the order expelling Jews was renumbered as General Orders Number 12 and was referred to it with this designation in subsequent correspondence. The text is in the headquarter books, but it will be found as General Orders Number 12. You'll also find it as General Orders Number 12 in more than one headquarter record volume. Series five of the grant papers is comprised of bound headquarters record books, and the material therein was written in chronological order by clerks on Grant's staff. Grant kept multiple record books going at the same time to ensure that the information was retained if something happened to one of the volumes. So the text of the order regarding expelling Jews can be found in three different volumes. This can also be the case for com other communications represented in different books. But back to the subject of the expulsion order. In a chronological sense, this document is out of sequence but I added here for two reasons. Despite, or maybe because of, the stain on his reputation from the Jewish order, Grant as president forged good relations with many of the Jewish faith. One example was Grant's attendance at the dedication of a synagogue in Washington, D.C. in 1876, which was the first time a president of the United States attended such a dedication. He also contributed $10 to the congregation. This receipt, and a letter of thanks for that contribution from the Addis Israel Hebrew Congregation is in the Grant Papers. The synagogue that Grant visited for the dedication still exists, but in a different location than its original spot. It is being incorporated into the new Capitol Jewish Museum in Washington, D.C. Obviously, Grant's output and correspondence increased dramatically during the Civil War, and therefore can be found in many different collections in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress. So let's spend a couple of minutes sampling some of his wartime correspondence. In February 1863, Grant wrote to President Lincoln from Vicksburg with thoughts on the pending promotions of a few military men. He could not say enough in praise of General John A. Logan. But Napoleon Bonaparte Buford? Uh, not so much. He could, would scarcely make a respectable hospital nurse if put in petticoats, and certain is unfit for any other military position. He has always been a dead weight to carry, becoming more burdensome with his increased rank. I particularly liked this one because it shows both Grant's honesty and sense of humor. I also like to imagine Abraham Lincoln getting a chuckle at this one, too. Whether due in part to Grant's critical assessment or other factors, Buford was appointed a major general in November 1862, but the U.S. Senate did not confirm the nomination, and the appointment expired in March 1863, not long after Grant wrote Lincoln. Buford then reverted to a brigadier general and spent the rest of the war in Arkansas. Shortly after the previous letter was written, the rumors of Grant's own promotion to the general of all the armies became almost a sure thing. But as we can imagine George McClellan crowing about his own talents, Grant characteristically wrote a most gracious thank you letter to his trusted commander and friend, William Tecumseh Sherman. Whilst I have been eminently successful in this war, in at last gaining the confidence of the public, no one feels more than me how much of this success is due to the energy, skill, and harmonious putting forth of that energy and skill of those who it has been my good fortune to have occupying a subordinate position under me. There are many officers to whom these remarks are applicable to a greater or less degree, proportionate to their ability as soldiers. But what I want is to express my thanks to you and McPherson as the men to whom above all others, I feel indebted for whatever I have had of success. 
Once Grant's promotion to Lieutenant General and command of all Union armies became a reality, Grant wrote to Sherman about his ideas for the spring campaign of 1864. As we can see, Grant was very much in accord with Lincoln's ideas of how to, the war ought to be prosecuted, with at least some coordination. This letter also shows Grant's level of trust and confidence in Sherman's abilities. It is my design, if the enemy keep quiet and allow me to take the initiative in the spring campaign, to work all parts of the army together and, somewhat, towards a common center. For your information, I now write you my program, as at present determined upon. I do not propose to lay down for you a plan of campaign, but simply to lay down the work it is desirable to have done and leave you free to execute it in your own way. Sherman responded by telegraph on April 9, 1864, that Grant's letters, quote, suit me exactly. Grant also forged a relationship of trust with Abraham Lincoln, who wrote to Grant on April 30th, 1864, not expecting to see you again before the spring campaign opens, I wish to express in this way my entire satisfaction with what you have done up to this time, so far as I understand it. The particulars of your plans I neither know nor seek to know. If there is anything wanting which is within my power to give, do not fail to let me know it. Lincoln's original letter to Grant is in the collections of the Huntington Library in California, but Grant's reply is in the Abraham Lincoln Papers of the Library of Congress. He thanked the president for his kind words and confidence and assured Lincoln he had no complaints with the administration's past support. Indeed, Grant stated, since the promotion which placed me in command of all, of all of the armies and in view of the great responsibility and importance of success, I have been astonished at the readiness with which everything asked for has been yielded without even one explanation being asked. Should my success be less than I desire and expect, the least I can say is the fault is not with you. Again, given the complaining and the blame gaming many of Lincoln's previous generals had done, we can just imagine Lincoln's sense of relief to read these words. And of course, through it all was Julia, who was herself involved in some of the visual aspects of the war. In June 1864, Grant sent Julia three stereoscopic views from Massaponics Church in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. He noted that photographer Matthew Brady is along with the army and is taking a great many views and will send you a copy of each. This stereoscopic view titled General Grant's Council of War is probably very familiar to you and Grant may have sent a copy of it to Julia. Staying on the photography theme for a moment, Julia was a frequent visitor at Grant's headquarters and her influence was captured in a sketch by the artist and soldier Charles Wellington Reed. In this sketch, Julia Grant is in the process of convincing her husband to have his photo taken, probably at City Point. Now you list, let him do it. It's the way he makes his living. It won't take but a minute, Mrs. U.S. Grant said in the sketch. I don't know if Reed witnessed this scene or heard about it later in some way, but it does ring true, especially in capturing the look of Grant's City Point headquarters. I also encourage you to explore the Charles Wellington Reed papers online at the Library of Congress, both because he drew Grant several times and because his Civil War illustrations generally are really just wonderful. Grant's Overland campaign in spring 1864 yielded mixed results. The casualty rates were appalling at battles like Spotsylvania in the wilderness. But rather than retreat, Grant hung on with a bulldog grip and a promise to quote, fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. It took all summer and longer. The campaign ultimately stalled before Petersburg, which resulted in a siege. But Grant's tenacity caught the popular imagination, which was especially important for Lincoln in the critical presidential election year of 1864. In this Courier and Ives cartoon, Grant is portrayed as the bulldog on the road, or rather the Weldon Railroad, to reclaim the doghouse of Richmond, while the Democratic presidential nominee, Little Mac, stands to the side, urging Lincoln to call off the big bad bulldog before he hurt the weaker canine Confederates. And yes, that bulldog is sporting a beard. 
In the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead quite a lot. Most of you probably know what happened in the intervening time, but just in case, 1865, the Confederacy collapsed, Lincoln was assassinated, his successor, Andrew Johnson, was, in my opinion, a disaster as a president, and the Reconstruction period that would have been challenging regardless got off to a rocky start. In these troubled times of 1868, it was Grant who ran for the presidency which inspired more visual representations of him. Some were more staid and traditional, like this chart of the Republican ticket with illustrations of all previous presidents. Some made use of Grant's short tenure working in his father's tannery to play up the working man element to Grant and his running mate, Henry Wilson. No matter that Grant actually hated the tannery, it came in handy for the illustrators, including this one, which blended the Tanner motif with Grant's military accomplishment in tanning the hides of Confederates and Democratic political opponents. Sheet music and advertisements also capitalized on Grant's presidential campaigns in 1868 and 1872 and his continuing fame as a general and president. Grant doesn't quite look him, like himself in the 1874 tobacco ad, being taller and more slender than usual. And for the longest time, he kept reminding me of someone until I finally figured out that Tobacco Grant looks a bit like Scottish actor David Tennant from Doctor Who and Broadchurch. Sheet music also engaged in some pretty bad puns, like this one, playing with Grant's 1868 motto, Let Us Have Peace which now became a vegetable served at the dinner table. I included this lithograph mainly because it's just so bad. Clearly the artist was still perfecting his sense of proportion that or Grant was going through a brief puffy sleeve fashion moment. But back to serious business. Grant was first inaugurated as president in March, 1869, and we have visual evidence of the event courtesy of Matthew Brady. Presumably, Grant is in the process of reading his inaugural address. And thanks to Grant's descendants, the Grant Papers at the Library of Congress contains his manuscript inaugural address, which was given to his son Fred at the White House in 1875. Grant's administration was notable for advancing civil rights, which on occasion inspired death threats like the one seen here on the left threatening his life if he signed the 1875 Civil Rights Bill, which he did and lived to tell the tale. But his presidency was tarnished by the exposure of several corruption rings in which subordinates and other government officials appeared to or did participate. Grant himself was not implicated in the corruption, but he seemed to either be unaware of the machinations or turned a blind eye to them. Either way, it reflected poorly on Grant's administration then and for generations to come. That said, it did inspire a wonderful 1880 Puck cartoon of Grant as an acrobat balancing multiple rings of corruption. And throughout, Julia was at her husband's side. The two remained devoted to one another, and this adorable note is preserved in the Grant papers. Julia writes, Dear Ulysses, how many years ago today is it that we were engaged? Just such a day as this too, was it not? Julia. The response, 31 years ago. I was so frightened, however, that I do not remember whether it was warm or snowing. Ulysses. Julia later added a notation. I find this among some old letters. I suppose I just then remembered that it was the anniversary of our engagement, 22nd May, 1844. After serving two terms as president, Grant left the United States in 1877 for what turned out to be an almost two-year adventure around the world. There are a number of collections in the manuscript division that include correspondence from Grant while he and Julia were traveling. But perhaps no single collection better captures the breadth of the trip than the Beale family papers. The Beals owned Decatur House on Lafayette Square and socialized frequently with their good friends and neighbors, the Grants. So it is not surprising that Grant wrote often to General Edward F. Beale, with whom he shared a love of horses, which is also present in these letters. 
in just this small section, we see September 1877, Inverness, Scotland. November 1877, Harris. March 1878, Constantinople. July 1878, Copenhagen. May 1879, Shanghai, China. August 1879, Tokyo, Japan. Grant proved to be a close observer of the countries and cultures he experienced. Writing to Edward Beale in 1879 from what was then known as Peking, now Beijing, China, he predicted, I would not be surprised to hear within the next 20 years, if I should live so long, more complaint of Chinese absorption of the trade and commerce of the world than we hear now of their backward position. Although it took a bit more than 20 years for China to become a dominant player in international trade, this letter resonates strongly with modern audiences. Grant also wrote home to his family, and this letter to son Fred caught my eye. It was written from Egypt in January 1878 on a part of the trip that was captured photographically, but it also displays Grant's humor, which is good-naturedly pointed in his wife's direction. One thing I forgot to mention, your ma balances on a donkey very well when she has an Arab on each side to hold her and one to lead the donkey. Yesterday, however, she got a little bit out of balance twice, but claims that the saddle turned. Of course it did. How could it have been otherwise with 185 pounds and a stirrup on one side and the donkey only weighing 125 pounds? But she rides a donkey very well on the whole. But Julia was a good sport throughout and such an intrepid traveler for a woman of her era. And what traveling they did. This has become my new favorite item representing the impressive number of countries on the Grant's final itinerary and the diversity of cultures with which they interacted. In this cartoon, the artist has represented Grant in the local dress of the many countries he visited, but always smoking his ever-present cigar. While some of the outfits today may seem to play into sartorial stereotypes, I still find it a great visual that suggests at a glance the breadth of Grant's exposure to international relations. And after engaging in some in diplomatic negotiations while in Asia, Grant might have made an impressive Secretary of State had he returned to government service, which he made an attempt to do. The Grants arrived home in time for the 1880 presidential election in which Grant was a serious contender for a third term, there being no constitutional prohibition at the time to serving more than two terms. In a May 1880 edition of Puck, the artist Joseph Kepler captured the drive of the stalwart Republicans toward the Republican convention in Chicago with this Grant Express cartoon, in which the machine politics of Grant's faction steamroll over the reform opponents in the background. I love the incorporation of Grant as the engine's smokestack with smoke coming out of his cigar. Grant ultimately lost the Republican nomination to the dark horse candidate, James A. Garfield. But as this image su suggests, Grant was as gracious in, even in defeat. Then the worst happened in 1884. Grant discovered that Grant and Ward, the investment firm to which he and his son Buck had lent their family name, as well as their savings, turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. When the scheme collapsed, so did Grant and Ward, and the Grants were left bankrupted. Remember, these are the days when former presidents did not receive a pension, nor was Grant receiving a military pension. As if those straits were not dire enough, Grant also learned that the pain he felt in his mouth was inoperable tongue cancer. Now his time and resources were both severely limited, and he had to consider his options for securing his family's financial survival. Grant picked up his pen and started writing articles about the Civil War. Then he agreed to write his memoirs. The Library of Congress is so fortunate to have in the Grant papers the manuscript pages that Grant hand wrote. Each page is truly a treasure, but some yield even more riches, such as this one that starts. Put this in after Cold Harbor, about the time the army reached the James River probably will be best. I have always regretted that the final assault at Cold Harbor was ever made. I might say the same thing of the assault of the 22nd of May at Vicksburg, 
At Cold Harbor, no advantage whatever was gained to compensate for the heavy loss we sustained. It's a fairly famous line in the published memoir, but the original manuscript page tells you that the text was not part of Grant's initial description of the campaign. Whether he consciously hesitated or the thought occurred to him after penning this section, we don't know. But the instructions on the top of the page and the different paper stock than the bulk of the handwritten pages, provides additional clues about Grant's writing process. Notations on many manuscript pages also allow us to see some of the revision process. Among other assistants, Grant's son Fred helped tremendously with research and corrections to his father's text. On this page, we see Grant's first pass at the narrative, written in his fairly familiar handwriting. Writing on Vicksburg and the use of African-American troops, we see that Grant added, this was the first important engagement of the war in which colored troops were under fire. These men were very raw, having all been enlisted since the beginning of the siege, but they behaved well. But the handwriting is clearly shakier and less compact. So we can speculate that the revision came later when Grant was declining physically. We also see Fred's correction, Wrong, colored troops had been engaged before, FDG. So this one page had at least three passes in the writing and revision process. Fred's correction was not implemented as Grant's edition was included in the published memoir toward the end of chapter 37 on the siege of Vicksburg. And who amongst us hasn't resorted to doodles when we have writer's block? Obviously this was a day when Grant's mind was less focused or maybe the doodling helped him to focus. The world closely followed Grant's race against time and the heartbreaking letter of just one little girl exemplifies this. Maria Casagrande, a student at the Fifth Ward Industrial School of the Children's Aid Society in New York, was chosen by her teacher to write General Grant in March, 1885 with prayers for his survival. Maria explained that the teacher kept them updated about his condition and that Maria herself bought a newspaper every day to follow his progress. Even in the era of cheap penny press newspapers, that still must have represented a significant expense for her. But she explained that the students generally, quote, know just how you are every day because all of our boys in schools are either newsboys or boot blacks. And the newsboys, of course, read it in the papers. It's a marvelous letter, not only in relation to the outpouring of feeling towards Grant as he fought his last campaign, but also for the myriad of clues Maria provides about the lives of impoverished children in Gilded Age, New York. In his last days, Grant retreated to Mount McGregor, New York for a more hospitable climate in which to work. This view is perhaps the most famous, but there are others. This one carries the title, on the piazza, one of the last pictures taken. General Grant, Drs. Douglas and Schrady, and Mrs. Grant form the group. And in another view, we see Grant on one side of the porch with Fred and Dr. Douglas consulting around the corner. As the cancer progressed and Grant experienced more discomfort in speaking, he wrote notes to keep up his end of conversations including with one of his physicians, Dr. John H. Douglas. Dr. Douglas retained the notes Grant wrote to him, and they are now among the collections at the Library of Congress. Most of the notes are about three by five in size, but some are larger. Some are written on blank paper, others on lined paper. A great many center on his physical condition, but some are almost poetic in language and insight. And I count these notes as among some of the most poignant of the Grant treasures at the Library of Congress. This one is about his physical condition and is along the lines of his normal handwriting. Based solely on the handwriting on this note, we can speculate that Grant was having a difficult time when he wrote about trying to regulate his body temperature under covers. Several of the notes contain significant intellectual content. I do not sleep, though I sometimes doze off a little. If up, I am talked to, and in my efforts to answer, cause pain. The fact is, I think I am a verb instead of a personal pronoun. 
A verb is anything that signifies to be, to do, or to suffer. I signify all three. This note is among my favorites because of the information it contains and its relationship to Grant's memoirs. I have been up writing my views of some of our generals and of the character of Lincoln and Stanton. I do not place Stanton as high as some people do. Mr. Lincoln cannot be extolled too highly. Another hand has added July 2 p.m., suggesting the note was written in the afternoon of July 2, 1885. And here in the manuscript draft of Grant's memoirs are the pages he wrote on his estimates of various generals. If the date annotation on the note to Dr. Douglas is correct, estimate of generals was written, likely written on July 2nd, 1885, which may be supported by the different paper stock, which is similar to that of the edition about regretting Cold Harbor. And here is the start of his section on Lincoln and Stanton. So if all the clues track, then these pages were written on July 2nd, 1885. And thus we know when this section of chapter 70 of the published memoir was written as well. The physical and mental exertion required of Grant to complete his memoirs is evident in this note from June 23rd, 1885, when he replied to a question with, I said I had been adding to my book and to my coffin. I presume every strain of the mind or body is one more nail in the coffin. And then the end came on July 23rd, 1885, just days after he finished the revisions on volume two of the memoirs. The memoirs were an immediate commercial and critical success, thus saving his family's fortunes. They are routinely counted among the best of the memoirs and have not been out of print since first published in 1885 to 1886. Telegrams in our manuscript collections document when the Grant family started notifying friends and associates like General Beale and Grant's Secretary of State Hamilton Fish of the general's passing. And as so often happens after a death, friends started reflecting on their relationships with General Grant, sometimes revealing new information. In January 1886, Fred Grant replied to a December 18, 1885 letter from General Sherman, who expressed concern that the family might interpret a false quote in a publication by General Fry as casting aspersions on Grant's reputation. A copy of Sherman's letter is contained in a letter book in the Sherman Papers at the Library of Congress. In it, he vowed that, quote, your father knew that I was true to him from beginning to end. There have been envious meddlers between us, but many times before his death, he told me that he valued my constant friendship as most precious. Fred's reply contained a particularly poignant detail about Grant's last hours. Fred assured Sherman that the family knew of Grant's continuing regard for his old friend. As to what my father thought of you, his letters to you and to my mother shows how, how he always felt towards you. And the last word he, father, ever wrote for his memoirs was while looking over the map of the Battle of Champions Hill. He looked at Bolton Station and wrote, Sherman. This was less than 60 hours before he died. Of course, Grant's story continues after his death with the publication of the memoirs, the history of Grant's tomb in New York City, and the dedication of the Grant Monument at the base of Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, all of which can also be researched at the Library of Congress. But in the spirit of hopefully leaving your audiences wanting more, I will stop there and invite you to visit us online or in person to continue exploring the Grant treasures of the Library of Congress. Thanks for your attention.